Welcome to the Game Day Playbook presented by Fan Food, a discussion around how leaders are transforming the sports and live entertainment industry by leveraging technology to enhance the fan experience and operate game day more efficiently. I'm your host, Rob Cressy. And joining me today is Kevin Millar. He played 12 years in the big leagues, including winning the World Series with the 04 Red Sox. He hit more home runs in his career than Pete Rose. He is also the host of Intentional Talk on MLB Network. Kevin, super excited to have you on the show. Robbie, that, that's unbelievable. When you said the Pete Rose thing, I, I got to go back and check those numbers again, but that sounds pretty amazing to get him branding. So I actually checked three times to make sure there wasn't another <laughs> Pete Rose that I didn't see. I was actually shocked at the lack of home runs that he hit. He hit 160, and I believe you hit 170. Wow. Yeah, 170, uh, but I do count the one in St. Paul, Minnesota. That was about two years ago when I was 45, so I count that one now in my own thing. So I say 171. So for those who don't know, can you give a quick, what was that one home run? I know about it, but it's a pretty awesome story. Yeah, two years ago, so they had a bobblehead day uh, for Bill Murray and myself. Bill Murray is a part owner of the St. Paul Saints which is a Northern League where I came up and had my first chance at pro ball in 1993. Uh, bottom line is they were having a bobblehead night in June. They said, hey, we'd love to have you up. And I said, hey, only if I could play any game. And I was joking at the time, but kind of serious. Like, that'd be kind of cool. I've played in about seven years. Well, they called me two weeks before and said, hey, by the way, we got it cleared. You're going to play in the game. So I started getting nervous. I haven't swung a bat in seven years. I'm like, oh, no, what's going on? So I took some soft toss the night before with my son. And we flew into Minnesota, went to the golf course, got to the field, took batting practice, couldn't hit a ball over the fence. I tried every pitch. I couldn't roll into the yard, I mean, to the, to the fence. You know, it was the first time you've swung. So game started, first at bat, first pitch was a ball. Second pitch I swung and hit a home run. You can't make it up. Seven years I hadn't played. I couldn't hit home runs when I was active, let alone seven years off. And that was pretty cool. That is absolutely fantastic. What a way to cap off a fantastic career. So let's talk a little bit about sports and technology. Technology has certainly changed from when you first started into, in the league until now. From a player's standpoint, how has technology changed the way that players prepare for a game? Yeah, I tell you what, Rob, it's, it's an amazing thing. When I first came up to the big leagues, we had VHSs. You know, we were watching our bats. We have to go back and rewind it and get to your spot. If you knew you were six minutes and 27 seconds, okay, get it fast forward. Then it, then it came to direct TV type, I mean, uh, the little uh, disc type scenes. and Those were a little easier because you could skip around. Well, now you look at the devices and stuff that you can do to impact your swing, your arm strength, where your velocity is with a curveball, your spin rate on your curveball. All of this technology now has enhanced the game in all sports, and that's why we see, uh, you know, so much, you know, the, the, a lot of the records are getting broken because you're like, yeah, players are bigger, stronger, and if you can put a little smarts into us, pretty awesome. And is that something that actually starts in the younger leagues now? So even if we were to think when you were starting to become, uh, when you're in Little League Baseball, you didn't have the same exposure. We had Tom Amansky's defensive drills. Now That's kids right. have the ability, like I didn't know how to throw a curveball because my only option was if I went to, uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, so if I went down to like a Pirates Players Day and John Smiley or Doug Drabeck's there to say, here's how you had to throw a curveball, I had no idea, but kids now, they have access to unlimited technology. So can we assume that records that we've seen in baseball and pretty much in any sport, players are going to get bigger, faster, stronger, and do things we've never seen because they have so much more technology available to them? Yeah, you have specialists now. You know, you got to know what you're going to play at 12 years old. Like, hey, you're going to play baseball, football, or bat. What do you No, I want to play them all. You can't because these kids are now, they're specialized in select balls and year-round and all the stuff. So the technology, because they could start almost homegrown, you know, you, you as a 12-year-old kid, like, yeah, you know what? You're going to be six foot four. You're going to throw 96 miles an hour. And if we could do – so the technology is what sets this. What sets the 100-pitch mark in baseball? Who thought of that? It could have been 80. It could have been 120. 100 pitches now. We get to 100 pitches, you start seeing the manager look, yep, uh, 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 yep, okay, we'll give him one more batter. Like, who said that technology? Because – 
X, Y, Z, there'll be a freak of nature at some point, like the Greg Maxson pitch, you know, one, what, 15 plus games, 50 straight years. That's never injured because you have impeccable mechanics, but they're able from the technology to know basically what we can actually do, or where's this ball going to go swing path. A guy like JD Martinez that totally went behind the scenes to change his swing when the, when the Astros released him. And now he's top 10 player in the major leagues. So let's look into technology with umpires. Are you in favor of robots calling balls and strikes with an automated strike zone, which I know has been dabbled with in some of the minor league leagues? Yeah, I, I, I'm not personally, in my opinion, I love the human factor of baseball. I love the gut feeling of baseball. I love when a manager might want to say, hey, Millar, you're hitting for X, Y, Z, and it could be righty on righty. It doesn't have to be righty, lefty, lefty, righty, perfect, because that's where I think we become robots. We're not robots. We're all human beings. So the human factor of Major League Baseball, I love. I love the you're out and the, and the coach coming out and hat backwards. What are you talking about? That's the human factor. If, if we wanted every cookie we ate perfectly rounded, no, sometimes the one that's coming off the side, a little bit burnt, you know, I, I, it, now you're getting too perfect. Do we want the game perfect? Of course. Everybody wants to know, like, the replay system. That's turned out to be a good thing. But the human factor behind the play, to be able to interact with an umpire, if I thought that ball was a strike or he thought it was a ball, that's the, the stuff that you don't want to lose in baseball because it's part of it. It's like hockey without fights. Yeah, and, and think about catchers who frame pitches. All of a sudden, would that art be done? Yeah, you're right. How many times we see that he's framing pitches or, or pitches got, whatever the – there's so many different things. Whatever they are, you, that's part of it now. Like when you go to a contract and negotiation – Hey, my guy over here, Ruff, he had a 59% frame to ball rate. You know, and you're like, what? No, you've been gifted because now, boom, boom, you know, you're able to get some pitches. What do you think that baseball can do to be more fan-friendly or make the fan experience better? Well, you know, the, the big talk has been these nets. Obviously, there's been some devastating situations that go on with balls that are, that are way harder than people think and fans think, and they come faster. You know, on TV, everything slows everything down. You can go catch a slant pattern from your cousin in the, in the yard, but you're not catching a slant pattern from Tom Brady. It'll break your fingers. But everything looks slow. In baseball, we've had some tragedies, so they put this netting up. You know, that's been the talk. Like, how do you make it fan-friendly? Do we have a netting that can drop down maybe? for batting practice up till game time and then be able to raise the net up, you know, because if you put that netting there all the way around from foul pole to the dugout, where's the interaction at? You know, you're trying to increase the fan interaction. How are we going to do that? I love that stuff. I love when players are signing for the kids down the right field, left field lines. I love the hand and batting gloves and wristbands and because you can remember that forever. Pedro, Pedro Guerrero played for the Dodgers. I grew up in Los Angeles, big Dodger fan. 10th grade, he gave me one of his wristbands. It said, say no to drugs, Pedro Guerrero's the pitcher and everything. I had that my entire high school career. Three years, I think it was, and it was the size of my arm. But those are the things like, he's my favorite player. Just from that wristband toss. To, so, the, you know, I just think, you know, the, the players need to, to, need to be, you want to feel like you're, you're all family, whatever city you're playing for. And you want to be able to, you know, get out there amongst the people and see them at dinner or whatever it is. So fan, players need to be more fan friendly, you know, make it a point, whether it's five minutes a day you sign or half an hour a day, go sign some autographs. And, uh, and I just think that, you know, you just need to keep spring training and, and allow the players to be more accessible. And for me, uh, Andy Van Slyke was the first player to ever sign my glove. And from that day, I fell in love with Andy Van Slyke and his crow hop yes. from center field. And actually, did you know you hit six more career home runs than Andy Van Slyke? What? That, he was an unbelievable player. I used to love his throw. And then he'd flip, basically, after he's trying to throw someone out from center field. Uh, of course, as an impressionable 10-year-old, what's cooler than seeing the center fielder flip while trying to throw somebody out at home? That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> so when you were a player and now a part of the media, how did you think about interacting with fans? Yeah, it, I've always been, you know, I, I, I've always been a guy that just, that loves to be out where I'm at, you know, and being in the big league. So I was able to, I always had a good relationship with the media. Uh, accountability is a huge thing, right? If you suck, you suck. Hey, listen, I made two errors. 
I struck out twice and I popped up with a guy in third base. So two outs of the seventh inning. It's okay for me to sit for my locker. You know, I sucked. I, 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 I it's my faults on me. So you, you, when a player doesn't have that, then there's a little bit of an issue, right? Then if you're blaming something, the ball was wet, it was cold out. Now there's a story. Now we have a story. And that's when we develop this little friction, right? If you're just accountable as a player, and I was always that, I felt, and I uh, had a good relationship with the media. I had no issues um, and loved baseball, and that's all I knew. So when I was done, it was an easy transition to kind of be the guy I was, which I've always loved the fans. Intentional Talk is my favorite baseball show because it's relatable and entertaining, and you get down like if I was chopping it up with my friends at a bar. Can you share a little bit about your mindset and how you approach it every day? Yeah, that was the one thing when you, you know, I was a baseball player my whole life. I, I, that's all I knew. It's all I did. And then it stopped. So at 38 years old, you're a young man in life, but you're old in sports. Like when Brett Favre retired, he was 40. It looked like he was Santa Claus. No, he's a 40 year old man, a young man in life. But, you know, you, you develop that. You're old, but you have a whole life ahead of you. Here comes television. They asked me to do a show. I, I suit and tie. I wasn't, you barely know, tie, tie. I wasn't very good. And they talked about doing a, you know, your own show. And I didn't know anything about it. I'm like, if I could be myself, you know, if Chris Rose, we knew each other from the best damn sports show. We'd kind of go on there, but if he could be himself, I can be myself. They had this, you know, silly idea. You had two guys talking baseball and uh, we, we tried it. I didn't know what it was about. And here we are going our eighth year. So it's a, it's, it's a really fun show. We have a player on, uh, every single day that makes it fun it, it allows players I don't care what you're hitting and I don't care how many wins you have I want you to tell us something about the that the fans don't know you know what kind of planes do you guys fly on who's the cheapest who's the worst dressed you know who's the the one guy that thinks he's you know whatever a fan of, of whoever that's the stuff that's fun and I think that uh, we try to bring that you know that form my favorite moment of the show was Josh Reddick on the A's coming out as the ultimate yeah. warrior. And from yes. that, point, I was like, I love Josh Reddick and I love this show. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, there's a certain perfect example. You guys had Steven Vogt and he came out and did the referee. Uh, I think a year later, we had some great Oakland A's guys because Johnny Gomes played out there for a little bit, but that's what I'm talking about. They have fun. They're skits. Promote what you want, make fun of who you want. And that's what we, I always tell players. It's your, it's your show. The show's going to go on, but this is your time to go. So I'll wrap you up with some quick questions. What do you believe are the key elements to a winning culture? Listen, I, I, I'm a fan of chemistry. I think everybody at that level could play. Everybody can catch, field, run, run throw, right? I, I think when you have teams, that people that care about each other, it, it, it's a big deal, whether that's eight games or 15 games a year, but it's a big deal when you're playing 160 game schedule so i think team chemistry is huge do you have a piece of advice that you've been giving that really resonated with you throughout your career i i i have fun i'm telling you we get so caught up in jobs and and, and we're fast and we got devices and we're going and we're always available so rarely are we enjoying the moment and and, and enjoy and, and and have fun doing whatever that is the grind becomes a grind the fun times go we're so worried about the other stuff that we forget to have fun so playing baseball I always had fun I enjoyed every day and on tv same thing I, we have fun I laugh is every day I'm laughing Kevin I had a ton of fun talking with you right now I continually enjoy your show where can people connect with you Twitter's at KMillar15, and then uh, Instagram at KevinMillar15. Pretty confusing, but there you go. You can find us over there. And as always, I would love to hear from you about this episode. What are your thoughts on robot umpires? Do you want them? You can hit up FanFood on Twitter at FanFoodOnDemand, on Instagram at FanFoodApp, or on LinkedIn. And as always, you can hit me up on LinkedIn by searching Rob Cressy. It's going, going, it's in there. A new major league record.